Uh, hi, good evening. Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be invited to speak at this event, so thanks to Joe and the organising committee. It's also a great pleasure to be here in this very beautiful part of Ireland, and it's even more important for me to have an opportunity to add to this discussion on a subject that really does touch the life of pretty much every person in this state at some stage. And as you've heard in the introduction, I've been at the head of the HSE, or the Health Service, as I prefer to, record, to refer to it, for almost five years. But what you may not know is that it's a job I never actually asked to do. Uh, I didn't apply for it as you do for most jobs. Instead, I received a, an invitation uh, from the Minister of the Day back in 2012. And what you may not know either is that for the previous five years, and uh, Donald has referred to my work in, in breast check, amongst other things, I was doing my utmost to keep the National Cancer Screening Services out of the HSE. Um, so I, come to the, I came to the job from an interesting perspective. And I only accepted the, the invitation uh, because the principal task was to oversee the abolition of the HSE and to move away from centralized control across the vast number and diversity of services towards a model that involved greater devolution of decision-making, responsibility and accountability to frontline services. And this is what we are attempting to achieve today through our embryonic hospital groups and community healthcare organizations. And the reason I'm telling you this is because in responding to a title such as our dysfunctional health services, which of course is a headline or a comment that we hear and read very often, I need to be clear from the very outset that while I was never a fan or even a great fan of the HSE concept, I do disagree with the populist and simplistic sentiment that our entire health service is dysfunctional because I simply don't believe it to be the case. And so despite my views on where the HSE came from, uh, today I do applaud and defend the great work done by both the health service as a whole and the individuals who, for the, very, for the most part, work unselfishly delivering care. And what is often forgotten in certain elements of media coverage, political debate, and the often self-serving narratives of interest groups, is that the greater majority of the health services delivered in this country today is in fact of a very high standard, with a much lesser minority of services which could justifiably fall into the dysfunctional category. And I would be the first to admit are not of sufficiently high standard and in some instances are quite poor and that there are very many reasons for this, some of which have already been discussed. Unfortunately, in the rush to focus on the negative outcomes, the great work undertaken by clinicians, allied health professionals, administrators, managers and many others rarely gets a mention and it's my job to ensure that it does, and I make no apologies for that. So the question then really is why can we not get the minority of underperforming services correct after so much effort and so many attempts over the years? And the reasons for this are multiple and diverse, and I could use up the entire evening discussing them, but I won't, don't worry. Um, I could, for example, discuss today how we are still playing significant catch-up following decades of underinvestment in health and in particular over the last six years during the austerity period. I could describe how a lack of national integrated systems, including electronic health records, HR systems, and financial systems, in fact prevent us from having sufficient control over many of our important business transactions and records management. I could discuss that we attempt to operationalize a health system where the people who work in it had little input into its design, have little influence over the funding levels provided on a yearly basis, and whose inefficiencies are not the result of their decisions, but rather due to an absence of decision-making, of making hard decisions over generations, some of which you've heard about. Other topics that could be of interest during tonight's discussion include our mismatch between supply and demand. And I don't disagree for a moment with Roisin's analysis about the issues of eligibility and entitlement how our year-on-year -year increase in demand for services is far outstripping the financial resources provided to supply those services. Also, I could have included the outrageous prices charged by some pharmaceutical manufacturers for high-tech drugs that is eating into our ability 
to provide other vital services. These are discussions perhaps for another day and I will touch on some elements of this as I talk. This evening, with the time that I have available to me, I wish to propose and discuss two specific areas of concern. Firstly, our health services construct, I will suggest, is outdated and not fit for purpose and that we as a society are slow to make the really hard decisions in order to fundamentally change it. Secondly, accountability or the perceived lack of it is a topic that often portrays health services in a negative light, especially at times of public outrage following a tragic event. And I want to briefly touch on the challenges that exist in arriving at real accountability and why it is not always as simple as many would think. So turning to the first of those, when I contributed to the Future of Healthcare Committee at the tail end of last year, I argued that our health services model and design as it currently exists is simply no longer fit for purpose. It was designed for a time when we had a different, different demographic profile and the expectations around clinical governance and standards were not as they are today. Today, our population is older. Modeling forecasts tell us that the over 65s will increase by nearly 110,000 in the next five years. And that's great news and a great reassurance, I'm sure to most of us in the room tonight. However, wasn't being funny there, by the way. I'll be, I'll be in that place soon myself. However, the bad news is that a large proportion of this older age group now lives with two or more chronic conditions, which makes many of our older citizens more vulnerable and frail. We see the impact of this in our emergency departments, with many reporting a 12% increase in the over 75s being admitted to hospital through our EDs, which is a significant factor, but not the only one, contributing to ED overcrowding. For example, the local 24-7 emergency department in Letterkenny General Hospital reports a 14% increase in elderly and frail patients comparing May of last year to May of this year. 14%. There is no doubting that many of our elderly and other cohorts of patients who now depend upon the acute hospital setting could be treated far better and far more appropriately in other settings such as primary care and where possible at home. It would surely be better for them and cheaper for us collectively. So you may ask, why is this not happening? Over the past year, I have discussed the decisive shift that is required in order to shift from an acute hospital to a more primary care focus. A shift such as this requires us to build capacity outside of the acute hospital sector first in order to allow us to adequately manage chronic conditions. It also requires us to move services such as diagnostics, assessments and certain procedures that are currently provided in acute hospitals to the community setting. However, in order to achieve this successfully, a significant transitional fund, which lies outside of the normal health budget, is an absolute requirement. This will ensure that services can continue and in some cases increase while we build our primary and community care services to the required capacity and standard. We also need changes to occur in our acute hospitals. Our health system since the 1950s has been very hospital centric. The culture has long been if you are sick, you go to what we used to call A&E or now EDs. That brings you straight into the acute hospital setting, the most expensive part of our health system by a mile. We need to streamline the services that we provide in the acute hospital setting, eliminate unnecessary duplication of services in hospitals within close proximity, and indeed continue to develop centers of excellence. In some smaller acute hospitals today, for historical reasons, we see complex trauma care and other complex procedures provided in a situation where, from a clinical and safety perspective, this simply should not be happening. It is also important that we regularize our governance arrangements with the voluntary hospital sector. While the HSE is the majority funder of all voluntary hospitals, there is an expectation by the Public Accounts Committee and other bodies that we somehow control how these hospitals manage their affairs and comply with different government policies. However, recent media coverage has shown that the voluntary sector has a different view in terms of our role. This not alone creates inefficiencies, but also unnecessary tensions between organizations that need to work closely 
and with collegiality. And I welcome Minister Harris's establishment of a formal review to examine the future role of voluntary hospitals. I would just add, though, that of the, most, of the hospitals providing the most complex care, Cork University Hospital is not a voluntary hospital. St. James's Hospital is a fully state-owned hospital, and so too is Beaumont Hospital, although they're sometimes regarded as voluntary hospitals. So there's no necessary alignment between a voluntary-backed ethos and effective delivery of services. In addition to reforming the acute hospital system, it is equally, if not more important, that we enhance the range of services we provide in the community through our own GP and primary care services, such as the one just around the corner from here. This is particularly important for dealing with chronic conditions, especially for the frail elderly. Furthermore, we need to change the culture of the population who tend to use the acute hospital system as their default choice when they first need health, system, health systems. If we don't do this and keep doing what we are doing currently, we are most likely to see costs spiraling out of control due to inherent and historic inefficiencies in our system today, some of which I have mentioned earlier. In the longer term, we are likely to see a perverse result in that we will spend much more as a result of these inefficiencies than the cost of any investment or transitional fund required to transform to a more efficient system. Taking much of what I have just discussed into consideration, in the absence of a collective, societal and political willingness to make some of the hard choices required for change, I question, I really do question, whether it is possible that we can ever achieve a health system that can be truly operationally efficient, that can provide effective value for money, and can provide a world-class healthcare in both delivery and outcomes that we can collectively be, be proud of. A number of years back, I had the privilege of working alongside Professor Tom Keane in the design of the implementation of the cancer strategy. A lot of unpopular and hard decisions were made at that time. As I am sure you will remember, they were hard fought and strongly resisted. And for the record, County Donegal was not hiding in the shadows in that fight. However, 10 years on, while the hard decisions were not to everybody's satisfaction, I am absolutely convinced that nobody would want to go back to where we were. And the reason nobody would want to go back is that those hard choices have led to better health care and better health, care, health outcomes for those suffering most forms of cancer. Attempts to tackle much of what I have discussed earlier, including stopping some inappropriate services in smaller hospitals and centralizing care in other parts of the health services, requires a type of political courage that is not often apparent. As the truism goes, all politics is local. To be seen not to oppose what is perceived by many as cutting a long-standing local service is not exactly a great vote-getter. Regardless of the clinical risks that retaining that long-standing service might pose, society as a whole, all of us, and I do mean all of us, have an important role in all of this. Voters have an opportunity every five years or so to reward politicians and I do mean that, reward politicians who take the time to read the available clinical evidence and who support hard decisions, regardless of how unpopular they might seem, in the interest of having better and safer health services. Those who drove here this week from Dublin passed not too far from Ros Roscommon Hospital. This was an acute hospital that was providing a range of complex surgery and trauma care in circumstances where the clinicians in the hospital themselves question the safety implications. As I'm sure most of you remember, we ceased providing that type of complex care and changed the role of hospital to a more, more appropriate and thus safer service. This was undertaken while balancing a number of interrelated considerations, including clinical risk, the economic impact on the local area, and the maintenance of appropriate jobs for the hospital staff. In the background was a vitriolic campaign by some local people. Polarized views arose, resulting in much heated debate and protests. Some politicians were ostracized. Others used the controversy to raise their profile. Today, Roscommon Hospital flourishes, 
providing less complex procedures, but providing considerably more and badly needed outpatient services, day surgery and diagnostic services to the people of Roscommon and its environs. And so the sky has not fallen, despite the prophecies of many at the time. The Slauncher Care Report provides an ambitious vision of a different kind of healthcare system. It can only be delivered if a number of hard choices are made. I am optimistic that the ability of the members of the future healthcare committee to agree on consensus is a really good starting point. But that courage needs to be backed by us, all of us, as the hard choices ahead are made. Just before I move on to my second point, this first section on the current construct of the health services and closely related to the subject of hard choices is the requirement for an understanding that individual tragic cases will always exist and gain considerable prominence in the healthcare environment. I do not for one second want in any way to trivialize the grief and distress experienced by many families. When these cases occur, while we must improve the standards of our services based on lessons learned from individual tragic cases, we should not, however, develop policy and the future of world-class services based on these cases. Instead, future health services should be based on the best available clinical evidence and experience, just exactly as we did with the cancer program. When things go wrong in health and social care environments, the public demand, and rightly so, that people are held to account if they have transgressed. There is abundant evidence that vesting authority, empowerment, and responsibility as close as possible to the delivery of care produces better outcomes. With this authority and responsibility devolved to a more, a more local level, there will come real accountability and the ability to hold appropriate person or persons to account for their actions or inactions. However, being able to hold the appropriate person to account in the health services is fraught with difficulties for a number of reasons, particularly our long-standing and at times quite constraining disciplinary process that we are obliged to follow rigidly. Recent High Court decisions concerning very high-profile cases have supported long-standing processes agreed with representative bodies that prevent us from circumventing any agreed processes surrounding our disciplinary processes, regardless of the outrage expressed by the public, the media, or politicians. Long drawn out disciplinary processes often lead to us being accused of, quote, never holding anybody to, a, to account. In the absence of a person to whom we can readily point to, say, you down the back, for example, and say, it was your fault, what happens instead is that those at the very top of health services become the targets. There has been for too long a farcical ritual of the minister of the day being held accountable held accountable for every operational level event or decision made anywhere in the health and social care delivery system, even at the most micro level. As you can imagine, the effect of this is of course damagingly disempowering for those at local level and flies in the face of good leadership and management practice. The impact of this form of top-down micromanagement on the subject of accountability is all problems and issues, regardless of how minor, tend to flow to the center once controversy attaches to them. It enables a situation where the minister, myself as DG, a national director, regardless of the facts of the situation, invariably end up being the only persons held accountable by the media or an Oroctus committee. And this happens almost instantaneously. What this actually means is that those whose action or inaction actually led to the controversy often get to hide in the shadows and are rarely held accountable. It is this faux ritualistic form of instantaneous knee-jerk accountability that serves to undermine real accountability and it is at the heart of the original design of the HSE and that is why I am personally so committed to the creation of local accountable service delivery structures through the hospital groups and community health organizations. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. For many years now, we have merely tinkered around the edges of reforming our health service that has pretty much remained unchanged for the past 50 years. We have enhanced the range and quality of most of the services that we provide, and in some specialties we are as good, if not better, than most of our neighbors in the Western world, despite some people's best attempts for their own self-serving reasons to talk down our services. However, year in, year out, 
we are obliged to work with a system that because of its design is too expensive, because we have failed to grasp the, th the, horn the thorny thistle of fundamental reform. This involves courage, hard choices, and looking beyond what we are used to. It also involves each of us peeling back the arguments of the many vested interests in the health environment that we see so readily carried by much of our media and some politicians, as it tends to make good, provocative headlines. I would also urge vested interest groups, especially representative bodies, to follow the example of NHS Scotland and the British Medical Association who have taken a decision to stop talking down the role of GPs and is imp impacting significantly on their ability to recruit GPs and instead are pointing to the many positives of that role. If we can move beyond this point, we might then move towards a consensus on health that will allow us to finally leave any residue of dysfunctional healthcare delivery behind us for once and for all. Gramahagov, Golea Augustbanokt.